it's so good to have you here, Mr. Lowy. Frank. Frank. I'm so glad Rakefet Rusak Aminoach introduced us. Uh, this is a series on uncertainty, and Rakefet said to me, there is nobody who has dealt with more uncertainty in their life than you, Frank. And so it's a real honor uh, to be here with you. Um, I want to start with something that you actually just said right before we turned on the cameras, which is you heard for the first time that there are people who don't do Brit Milah, don't want to do Brit Milah in Israel, and you said, I can't believe that. Why does it bother you so much? It's just against my nature. I am a very committed Jew. Not religious enough, but I'm a committed Jew. I know religion, but I, sometimes I just maybe conveniently <laughs> don't practice it. Yeah. And uh, I do feel bad about it from time to time. I'll just tell you a little uh, anecdote. I used to play a lot of tennis in my young days. Not so young, but until I was maybe 60 or even more. And uh, of course I was working hard, so I didn't have enough time. So I started to play tennis Saturday morning. At the time I didn't have a tennis court, so I drove to the, to the tennis club. And I saw my compatriots, Jews, on the way to synagogue with children in the, the hand and the mother and, you know. And I was jealous of them and angry with myself. But wasn't jealous enough or angry enough not to play tennis. <laughs> but my conscience said to me, oh, why don't you do that? Because, you know, I mean, it's convenience and not enough conviction. But I'm a very strong Jew. I believe in it, and uh, maybe convenience <laughs> is stronger than, I mean, I loved playing tennis. Yeah. If I wouldn't have played tennis then, then I couldn't have, because otherwise I had a very busy life. Another little story for you is that uh, during the war I was in Budapest. I was 13 year old, 14 year old when the Germans took Hungary and the real persecution of Jews started. And uh, there was a ghetto in Budapest, and we were in the ghetto. And I went out of the ghetto a little bit deviously, but I got out and wanted to buy some food to bring to home for my mother. And on the way, actually I was with my sister, and she was living under false papers as a Christian woman. So we walked together, and suddenly I see behind us a man in a long coat, uh, or back, no, uh, from, uh, from, from, uh, no, or, no. Leather. Leather coat and a hat. And that was a kind of a uniform for detectives, Hungarian detectives, particularly looking for Jews. So I see here, I see him following, following us, and I said to my sister, Edith, you go left and I go right. I will draw him with me, so he, he, he will miss you. And that's exactly what happened. And eventually he caught me. Well, I didn't run because it would have been obvious. He caught me and said to me, you are a Jew. I said, no, I'm not. He says, let's see. I'll take you into the gate, next gate. You let your pants down and we'll see. In the Shamayim. You know, you can imagine where I was. So suddenly, I thought to myself, I fell down on the footpath and created a scene so that people came around me. And he was berating me, you bloody Jews, what are you doing outside? And you know, all what, all what he can do. And then there was silence for a moment or two. And a woman from the crowd says, why don't you let him go, poor boy, to his mother? Suddenly there was silence. He says, go, if I catch you again, ta 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 ta. You know. So Brit Mila reminds me of that, you know that, of course, it was a disadvantage of having it. But I was saved just the same. Uh, you know, so uh, 
I'm a very committed Jew, being Jewish and Israeli. And uh, I know a bit about the religion, but um, I, I don't practice it as much as I should. Would you say that was a defining moment of your identity, that moment? Well, I mean, I didn't know at the time. But, you know, these little, these little stories that suddenly come to me at certain times, unrelated to anything else around me, and comes to me. Well, when you want to think a bit about it, it is a defining moment. Of course, my father <coughs> was a religious man. He died for, for his feeling, you know. And uh, the Holocaust and its effect surrounds me practically all the time. I remember little things. I mean, this story that I told you, I haven't thought about it for, must be 10, 15 years. Suddenly I think about it. And suddenly it comes to me very often, events from the Holocaust that reminds me that I'm Jewish. Not that I need reminding, because I'm really Jewish, so to speak. Uh, I'm a committed Jew, Israeli, I was here the uh, first time I came when I was uh, in 1946, 45, 46. And uh, then I went to join my family, who meanwhile immigrated from Slovakia to Australia. And that was uh, in 1952. I got here in 1946. And um, I lived in Australia for most of my life. What causes a 14-year-old boy in the ghetto to walk outside and do something that you know is dangerous and try to go to the grocery store to buy food? Well, we were living in a household, mother and I. The rest of the family were uh, away. A brother and a sister lived on false papers. One brother was uh, in the Hungarian army. Hungarian army had a Jewish unit, which they used them as slaves. Was uh, in uh, Ukraine, of all places, with the Hungarian army. My father, he disappeared. One day, on 20th of March, 1944. Never heard from him since. Not at the time. I know his fate now, but, but that experience and the sadness of my mother, who lost her husband, my father, she had five or six brothers and sisters in Slovakia. And uh, during, before 1938, they visited each other because it was one country at the time. And afterwards they didn't. But they wrote letters every week. One came, one went. One came, one went regularly. Suddenly in the early 1940s, no more letters. And the pain, on my mother's being, I mean being, not just the face, just the sadness engulfed her. And uh, more or less I live with that. I'm not sorrow all the time, I have a very full life. And uh, unfortunately my wife passed away a couple of years ago after 68 years of being married. Wow. So, uh, I do a lot of memories, sad ones, but at the same time, I do have a lot of wonderful memories of my mother, of my family, and, uh, but it's part of me, never to be, not to be. And when somebody tells me that a Jew in Israel has the child, have a child, a boy, and they don't circumcise him, is unthinkable. Every part of my body rejects it. 
I suppose if you were born in Israel and you are a Chilani or some, I don't know, or maybe it's okay. For me, it's absolutely, totally wrong. So the same boy who goes out from the ghetto to get groceries or food for the mother also comes to Israel alone after all of this, right? right? Right after the war. Yeah. 1945, 46. It was 45, actually. You were 16 or 17 years old? 15. 15. Why did you come by yourself? Where did you have the guts to come by yourself then? Well, look, <clears throat> the Kehila, where I was born, was a place called Filakovo. Before the war, there were 150 to 200 Jews, so it was very small. Everybody was religious. It was, was Shomer Shabbat, Kashrut, everything. Life was around the religion. And, uh, and uh, that's, what, that's what I am. Really, the beginning of that, that's what I am. But I need to ask you the full question again. What makes a 15-year-old boy? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> there's a little story to that. We lived in Filakovo, and it was uh, Czechoslovakia, and then it was Hungary. And when the Hungarians came, there was uh, anti-Semitism. They brought them with themselves. It came to, it came to them at that time with the mother's milk. It's not a nice expression, but it's a fact. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, I just told you before that we were in Budapest, living there, and came back after the war to Filakovo, to Slovakia. About 30 people, 30 to 35 people, came back from the war. And uh, most of them were males, between 30 and 50. I was the only child. Wow. In the, in the whole Jewish community, except I had a cousin, whose father also disappeared, and we were living in the one place. And you cannot imagine how I felt the desolateness of that place is just unthinkable for me to stay there. I was uh, 1945, I was 15. The choice was to go to school. I just couldn't imagine to go to school in that place and be part of that uh, milieu. And I was sitting on a bench at the park one day, and I said, I'm not going to stay here. At that time, there were shlichim from uh, the yeshuv mm -hmm. to look for young people to get them to come to Palestine. So I heard about it, and uh, I went to my mother. I said, Mother, I can't, I can't live here. I can't stay here. I didn't say the... Dramat the, the dramatics of being Jewish and all this. And I want to go to Palestine. There is some people coming here in a few days, and I want to go to Palestine. So mother said, go, go my son, with my blessing, and we will come after you. So I recognized and realized in my youth, head, I don't know how, where, but this was not a place for me. And then uh, I went to Hachshara in uh, a place called Koshitze, where there were maybe a hundred boys and girls. And then uh, one day came, and the Shaliyah came and said, tomorrow we are going to Palestine. So <clears throat> it was great happiness, dancing and singing, and you can imagine yeah. what was happening. And, uh, <clears throat> I, I didn't even have time to go back to Filakovo to say goodbye to my mother because it was, you know, this, it was Ali Abed, it was everything was illegal. But I, I had somebody who went to see, tell my mother that uh, we are leaving. And then <clears throat> we boarded a train as a group 
probably must have been 50 or 60 of us. We, the train took us to Prague. From Prague, we went to, uh, to France, to Paris. From Paris, we, they took us, we were a few days on the way. It was quite a bit of fun. We were in Prague for a few days. There are some photos in my place, oh, yeah? still from that time. And then we went to Paris. I remember in Paris, it was the first time I had ice cream. I mean, we can't imagine here that ice cream is something that you... Right. Well, I had no ice cream before, you know. Maybe the occasionally it was a, had to be some big simcha <laughs> to get ice cream. Can you still taste that ice cream? I can taste it, that's right. <laughs> and then the, the, the group, they took us to Marseille. Next to Marseille, there is a small airport. I forget the name for it now. And uh, then the, they took us to the Namal there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we saw a ship. They told us a ship. I mean, it looked everything just not like a ship. You know? <laughs> but anyway, there was room for it. There was built, it was built for some 150 people and 750 Jews got on that ship and a uh, day or two later we sailed for Palestine. You, you didn't speak any Hebrew, I assume, at the time. No. Some Yiddish? A little Yiddish. A little Yiddish. Yiddish. Hungarian, well, you spoke? Hungarian, of course, yeah. That was the and, main language. And you're 15 years old. 15 years and old. And you didn't say goodbye to your mother. And I didn't say goodbye to my mother. And you get on a train with a bunch of other young people yes. going to this uncertain place that's yes. not a state. Yes. Why? What causes you to do this? Like, well, what? What about Frank causes you to do this? Well, I think, I think we need to do what does it cause? What causes me to do it? The circumstances that was presented to me at 15 to be living back in that hellhole. Don't forget, before I went to school there for a while, it was a bloody Jew. Yeah. You know, my name, you asked me my name, my name is L-O-W-Y, but they made me to change it in the school to Levi, because Lowy is not a Jew to them. Levi is a Jew. Wow. I mean, it's a small little incident. But I it's mean, who you I, are. It comes to who you are. That's right. Well, that's why when I, when I tell you about the Brit Milah or no Brit yep. Milah, that's where it's all come from. My Jewishness is total and absolute. But, but also, I didn't know it then, but obviously it was already then. Is that what drew you to come to Israel, you think? Well, of course. I mean, there was a terrible place. And, uh, because people went to America, they went to Canada, they went well, straight I mean, to Australia. Well, I didn't... Well, let me be honest. Yeah. I had no opportunity to go to America mm -hmm. or to Australia or to Timbuktu. <laughs> the opportunity was to get out of there with other Jewish boys and girls to Palestine. I didn't look for other opportunities. There were no other opportunities. So it just was one thing to do. And of course, obviously I had Zionist inclinations, come from a religious family. I went to Cheder and, uh, you know, survived a terrible war. Mm -hmm. And uh, many things to me happened unplanned and unthought, just spontaneously comes to me to do. Do you plan a lot of things today or do you wait for things to come to you unplanned or unthought? <laughs> Planning. I do plan a lot, by the way. You don't. You, you don't. I plan. do plan. You do a plan lot. a lot. I do plan a lot, but my instinct does, in the main, does the planning for me. Interesting. Yeah. You rely on your instinct a lot. Absolutely. Why? Because it did good for me. Most people don't do that, though, right? Most people no, think I'm, about them. I am me. I'm not most people. I like to make decisions spontaneously, because I, I rely on my instinct and I rely on myself that if it doesn't happen that way or this way, I will be able to sort myself out. Of course, this is not a thinking process. This is, a, this is what I am, you know. What's the most spontaneous decision you've made recently? 
recently? Yeah. How recent? Last few years. Come to Israel. Come to Israel. After 60 years or 50 years or something like that, living in Australia, I sold my business, very big successful business. And uh, I was here from 46 to 52. I kept in touch with the country all the time. I was, a, I was a thought of myself an Israeli in Australia. And uh, even though you were only here six years, you thought of yourself as an Israeli in Australia. Well, that's amazing. Maybe, maybe I could really say as a Jew, as a Jew in Australia. Tag on the Israeli bit. Okay. I don't know which one comes first, but I'm a very committed Jew. And that's why when I hear about Jewish people in Israel don't circumcise their sons. I mean, it's, I, don't, I can't find the words how to express it other than absolute and total disgust. So you decide how many years ago to move to Israel? Three? How many years? How long ago did you move back to Israel? Uh, for five years. Five ago. years ago. Yeah. What made you do it? Just wanted to be here. You wanted to be here. Yeah, it wasn't that easy. Unfortunately, my wife was very sick already. And uh, people told me, Frank, you're crazy. You're taking your wife, sick woman, very sick woman. She had dementia. She really was very sick. So I said, what's wrong with going to Australia? There are airplanes. And uh, if you are sick, you're sick here and you're sick there. But at least you're sick in Israel. I did, uh, I did, uh, I did want to come. I said wrongly, you are sick here yeah. or you're sick there, you know, it's not much difference. But uh, we came here five years ago. I built a house 20 years ago here in Israel. I didn't know why I'm building it, but I knew that I will use it one day. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, that's, that's really me, you know, in a way that I do things. Something tells me inside to do them. And I follow my, my instinct. So you get to Israel in 1945, 46. In 1948, the war breaks out. Yes. You're 17, 18. Tell me about that time. Well, of course, I was in Zdeyakov, Aliyat Noir. Although I left Zdeyakov and came to Haifa and got a job as an as a apprentice uh, plumber. Anyway, that's a side story, so we don't need to go there. But I had to eat and, you know, think. So, your question was again? 1948, the war yeah, breaks 1948. out. 1948. Um, I belonged, we there were what, in the end we remained about 12 to 15 of us from the group that left from Czechoslovakia to Israel, to Zdeyakov. And we were a unit. And, uh, the, uh, we were learning about self-defense um, in the, in the Moshav already. And uh, <clears throat> the declaration of the UNO in November 1967 was an unbelievable event, unbelievable event. The whole of Israel was on the street dancing. In 1947? 1947. Right. 1947. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> then we decided as a group of us that we were together early in February 1948 that we volunteered to the army as a unit. And of course they took us in happily and uh, we were happy to be in the army. And I finished up uh, being in the Golani, in the commando unit of Golani. Tell me something from that time. I, I mean, it's amazing. You know, people who survived the Holocaust, my wife's grandfather, like this also, turn up here, kids, join the army, go from one war to another war. It's, it's remarkable. We're all here because of your sacrifice. But what was it like at the time? Like, you walk in there, they hand you a gun. They say, okay, go to battle. You had just gotten out of the Holocaust. You, you must be saying, what, what do I need this for? I must tell you about the hand you a gun. Yeah. 
There was a guitar of 10 of us, no, 12, I think it was 12. Some of these numbers are a bit... Fuzzy. Today. Rubbery, fuzzy, <laughs> fuzzy. A gun. Five of us had guns and five of us had sticks. And that's what, that was our, and we were serving in uh, Gesher on the border with Jordan. And we were there minding, this, minding the place, you know. And uh, guns we only got when the guns arrived from Czechoslovakia. It was, uh, I think, middle of the, sometime middle of 1948 or something like that. Mm -hmm. So what would it, what it feel like? We felt to be where we need to be. It was uh, interesting, you know. I mean, we were alone, boys and boys, the girls were left, and uh, we were together. And the uh, army unit, it was, it was okay, you know, I mean, look, at the Aliyat Noir when I was in Steyakov, was also, we were together. But there we were together in the army together. So, uh, it was fine. We had no complaints, we had nothing to complain about. There was nothing great either, you know. <laughs> But um, we were living in tents, of course, and uh, were uh, on duty at night to watch the bridge there in Gesher, whether the Jordanian come or not come. And, uh, and from there, we were recruited by the uh, commando, the, the head of the commando unit in uh, Khatiba Ahad Golani, to go and be with them. They were in the Emekhayad in Tiberias. They had a very big fight in uh, Lubia. And uh, then they lost quite a few of them. So they were very glad to take us in as a replacement for them. So let me ask you a hard question. So it's 75 years later right now. And I listened to you say it was 1944. Uh, I had to take care of my mother and go out and get food. I, I had to get on the ship and leave Slovakia. Uh, I, I went with my friends. We had to go in the army. We were where we were supposed to be. I think today if I go around and ask the average 15 or 18 year old, he says, I want to be where I want to be, not where I need to be. How do you relate to that? How do you think about, you know, I want to be what I want to do, what I want to be, not where I am needed or where I need to be. Well, I think the world is totally different. The family unit, even though it's not as strong as it was some time ago, there's a mother and a father, and maybe a brother and a sister, and maybe grandchildren or grandfathers, and you are a child. But you were not a child here. You were it. You were it. You didn't have your mother or father with you. You had no relatives with you. Who you did have is your friends. So if you decided to go to one unit or one uh, wherever, it was always the number. You know, we were together. Some of us, some of us, probably. I mean, I don't imagine it. I don't exactly know. Some of us were the leading type. Was not a leader, so to speak. But I think I was one of those people that said, let's go here and let's go there. I can imagine, I think I can more than imagine that um, I was one of those people, well, let's go here or let's go there. And that was, that replaced mother, father, grandfather, whatever was, there wasn't. So that was it. Do you ever ask yourself about your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, whether they'll have the fortitude and, and independence to say, let's go here, let's go there, and be independent like that in the way you were? Well, it's, it's not natural to be independent. When you belong to a family, you have the structure, particularly when the father and the mother are, are there, and you take them to guide up to a point. Of course, there are young people now, in their teens maybe, that make decisions by themselves for themselves, but not for a unit. Because uh, there are great opportunities. This place is a great opportunity for young people. So 
You know, I don't think you can compare that world to this world. You were married for almost 70 years, right? Yes. First of all, what was the secret to 70 years of marriage? And second of all, how did being married for 70 years shape who Frank Lowy is? Two. How did it shape who you are? Shape. You, yeah. Well, number one, I had a wife that loved me to earth. And uh, we were a very good pair. As it happens, I was the decision maker more, but we, we always decided together. Maybe I, you could say that I took the lead. I probably took the lead. She was the daughter of a, a Jewish couple who were immigrants themselves from England and Poland. And uh, they came to Australia in the, after the First World War or around that time. And uh, we just suited each other. We met at a Hanukkah party in 1952. Here in Israel or in Australia? In Sydney. In Sydney. And we looked at each other. I mean, it's a little bit romantic, you know. But, but uh, we stayed together for the rest of our life. Would you say that being married enabled you to take, we'll come in a second to your business career, enabled you to take more risk and be more of a leader? No, I don't think so. I, I mean, I had a very good family unit. Mm -hmm. There was total loyalty between Shirley and I. And we have three sons who are uh, in their own right. They are people in their own right, made a, made a success of their lives. And uh, we, as it happens, we are a business unit also. Three sons and I are a business unit. And uh, the family structure was very solid. And uh, I was very lucky to have three sons who didn't need to be under my uh, umbrella. But uh, it happened that we had, we had an umbrella of which maybe you could say I was holding it. But, but they would have been all right on their own. But there was a desire by all of them, by three of them, to be working with me. And we became a very successful business machine. I mean it in the sense that I'm saying it. Yeah. And we created a, uh, well, they weren't that, I created with another, with another partner, a company which built shopping centers. Happened to be all around the world by the time. Yeah. I don't know whether you heard about the company or not. I have. So I don't need to talk about that. You can fill in. But, but why did you go? To 1952, you don't speak a word of English, I assume, at this point, right? Not much. Not a word, right. And you pick up and you leave Israel to rejoin your family, or find family, in Australia. Why do you do that? Like it's again, I got on the boat, I went to Palestine. Yeah. Palestine. I then fought a war. You have your friends now in Israel in an independent life. And in 1952, you say, yeah, I don't speak any English, but see you in Australia. Yeah, but there is a reason for that. Okay. Uh, I told you the story of me coming to Palestine. Yeah. I had a brother and a sister remaining in Slovakia together with my mother. She got married to another Jew, and that, that guy had relatives in Australia. Mm -hmm. So they immigrated from Slovakia to Australia. And <clears throat> I was here alone for a while, but then a, a brother joined me. So there was mother, daughter, and a son in Australia. And together was me and my brother here. After all the drama of the World War, of father disappearing. The desire was to unite the family. 
And of course, I had nothing to offer them to come here. And of course, it wasn't so simple. My mother was in her 50s. And uh, I don't think that my brother-in-law would have wanted to come. But anyway, we decided for a family unit to be together. And my brother and I flew to Australia in, 1950, in January 1952. I hear the same thing coming back, theme coming back and back in everything you say. It's, I want to take care of my family, I want to be with my family, my Jewish family, because you keep repeating that. Is that a fair assessment of Frank Lowy's life? Yeah, I'm Jewish through and through. And, and I want to take care of my family and be sure I'm around my family. Yeah, I, 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 I haven't thought about it in these words, but I think my actions for you, that comes up on your computer. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact is that yes, yes, I can answer yes to that. And so when you think back about your legacy, you built this unbelievable business empire, global business empire yeah. of, sh of shopping yeah. centers. Yeah. Um, you moved from Slovakia to Israel, you fought in the War of Independence, you went to Australia. When you look back after 125, when you look back you after- You can negotiate on that. <laughs> okay, 130. <laughs> <laughs> after, this uh, is my style. <laughs> <clears throat> what should be said about Frank Lowy? Well, look, I am what I am, but I'm not going to describe myself because I see myself as, as, a, as, as what I am, but I not presume myself to be so wise to be able to talk about myself and not to sound in some way show off or you know, something like that. I am what I am for myself and for my family. And I think people around me who know me judge me. Either like me or dislike me. But I, I, I cannot in all conscience to describe myself because I will either undersell myself or oversell myself. So let me ask you a overselling book. is not one of my characteristics. <laughs> I mean, books were written about me, but I don't read them. People ask me, why don't you read them? I said, I'm not comfortable reading about myself. Here now you're asking me that I should describe myself to the Kola Olam of who Frank Lowy is. So I ask you a different question. Yes. You don't know my children. No. But if you wanted to tell my children, not your children, my children, one thing about the future, what would it be? One piece of advice. Believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. That's it. If you want one sentence, of course you can write a book about it. Hundreds of pages. But believe in yourself. Do you think... Do you think... Most people have a hard time believing in themselves? Well, I think a lot of people do. Why? Because they're not, they're not decisive. Because they don't know who they are or because they can't make well, decisions? Look, people are made differently and people have talents, different talents. To recognize yourself, of what you can and what you can't do. You really need to know yourself. So if you know yourself and you know your limitations and you try and stay with the limitations, but I don't believe in the limitations. But I think if you're talking about people, if you know your limitations or you think you know your limitations, you may go to the limit and suddenly you discover that those limits are not limited for you. So you push a bit, shove a bit, move a bit, dance a bit, cry a bit, shout a bit. And that's what happens. I mean, I think I haven't explained it to anybody before, to the question that you are asking me. 
you're kind of provoking me beyond myself. You said very quickly that you don't see limits. No. Why not? I don't believe in them. Why not? Where does that come from? Because all the, li all the limits I would have set for myself would have been, would have done disservice to me. Because I achieved a lot. I'm proud of my achievements. I don't shout about them, but I'm proud about them. And uh, unless you take a risk, you know, I don't need to tell you, the risk reward system, you know. I do have that. I mean, in the business, of course, you need to have risk and reward. If you run a big organization or even a small organization, you have to know the limits of your capacity, the limits of your capacity of your people, the amount of money that you can use profitably, how much you can borrow, and what are the risk rewards. Of course, these are, this is like a rubber. It's nothing is fixed in them. This is a piece of rubber that you pull, you pull, and if you overstretch it, bingo, it breaks. So it didn't happen to me, although uh, there were some close calls in my business career, but I was able to master them or fix them or solve them. How do you train your mind and your heart not to see or feel limits? I mean, I don't know, I just do. <laughs> <laughs> Look, most things I didn't learn, you know. I mean, the circumstances of my life, I didn't have a youth, zero, in the terms of people go and play golf or things like that. So, um, I don't know, I just, I just, I do have a judgment of my capacity. The school of, re the school of real life. Of real life. And often, uh, yeah, often, sometimes often, I have overstepped them, but I had the resources to fix them. I am also a good listener, particularly in crisis, when you take advice. And I took advice. I'm a very good listener. And if I uh, believe in somebody who is an advisor of mine, then I ask the question. And of course, don't do exactly what he said, but, uh, but uh, I do listen. And then interpret it for myself, you're of, uh, how to go about it. You're a wise man who's seen more than most people. What worries you about the future? What worries you about the future when you are 92? Have a guess. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I hope. And uh, I hope that I'll have many more years left. 135. You can negotiate with me. <laughs> I'm not a bad negotiator. I, I, I've heard. <laughs> and, yeah. and what is your view of Israel over the coming decades? Well, I think I was just telling <clears throat> Rakefet okay, that. that I was at a dinner a couple of nights ago. They're nice people, reasonably well to do. And they were talking about Israel in a, not a complimentary way because this is wrong here, and that is wrong here, and the other is wrong here. And I got fed up. And I said, you don't know what you're talking about. And I told them the positive things about Israel. I don't need to repeat them because we'll be here all night. Mind you, so would the negative. <laughs> so, you know. But I'm a positive thinker. I do think of Israel very highly. That small country of 600,000 people 70, 80 years ago, look what they have created. Just look at it. I mean, the discussion was about health. And there was an American there, and I said, America, you can die. Here, somebody will pick you up, take you to Beit Cholim, Kupat Cholim, or whatever. But 
It doesn't happen anywhere else. That one example of the health treatment in Israel is unique. I agree. You know? And it was okay when we were poor, and it's still okay when we are rich. And it's unrepeatable, and there are so many things about us. You know, I was, I go back a little, not many weeks, but uh, Bennett, when Bennett was the Prime Minister. And I heard on the news that he's going to talk to Putin of me mediate. I mean, he didn't get anywhere, but the thought of an Israeli new Prime Minister either called or goes on his own to talk to Putin of what he should and shouldn't do. The act in itself is an unbelievable achievement for Israel. Now, if you don't see that, you're blind. One last question for you. If you could have, this is a tough question, so I apologize for it. If there's one thing that Frank Lowy now could fix in the past, what would it be? In the past? It's too many things to say. Too many things to say. Too many things to say. Of course. If there's one thing you could fix right now, what would it be? Right now? Yeah. For what, personally? Anything. The thing that Frank Lowy most wants to fix. Oh, that's a big question. I haven't thought about that thing, but the big question. You got the tape run a bit, and then you have to cut it off. It's OK. Because there'll be silence for a little while. It's OK. What is it that I want? Being thoughtful is in short supply these days, so. Well, you know, for Israel? Whatever you want to fix. I, don't, I would like to pass, but I, I, I let me give me a little more. No problem. Give me a little more. Well, I think that if Israel could live in peace with the Arab nations. I think that would, be the, that would be the biggest thing that we Jews could have. Because the opportunity that it will give Israel to grow further is unlimited. Because look what we have achieved. And if I can, can use the word we, I had a little part in it. What we achieved? is unthinkable if you add up all the pluses. I mean, that we are a, a, a major military force, that we are, our economy is doing very well. And uh, whatever else goes with it, I think that would be the, the most rewarding things that we, not me, that we could get for Israel to be able to live in peace in this area and prosper with, the, with our Arab neighbors. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to sit with okay. me. It's my pleasure. I come out of here uh, inspired and uh, emotional to hear your life story, to think about what you've gone through and all of your stops in Jewish history and that you decided to come back here when you did and sit at a table with other people and explain just a few nights ago that our life here is good. As they say from the Torah, Tova Aretz Me'od Me'od, and we have so much to be thankful for, and I think you are a living testament thank you. to that. And thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank it you. was my pleasure. Thank you. To talk to you. This was an honor for me. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.